Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a really just a tutorial video on how to assemble a 1-6 scale Armor Packs white metal M5 Stewart M1919 machine gun set. It sounds like a mouthful, but basically if you have the 1-6 scale 21st Century Toys M5A1 Stewart, one of the weaker aspects of that kit is the kit supplied M1919 machine gun. The 21st Century Toys model itself is really nothing more than a scaled up version of the old Tamiya M5A1 Stewart kit from the 1970s or 80s time frame. Well, the 21st Century model inherits a lot of the aspects of that kit, arguably a lot of the inaccuracies, but a few of the parts transition from 135 to 16. And although in 135 they may do the job pretty well. In 1-6 scale, they become a bit deficient. Well, just like with EastCoastArmory.com, there are a few other options out there for aftermarket replacement parts for this vehicle, and Armor Packs is one of them. Armor Packs is a UK-based aftermarket part company, and he specializes in white metal components, as well as some wrestling components too, for 1-6 scale parts. And of course, this is for good reason, because like I stated before, his parts are highly recommended. Well, a few months ago, a viewer of the channel contacted me. He has a 1-6 scale 21st Century Toys M5 Stewart, and he wants to upgrade the machine gun that's supplied with the kit. The individual had the armor packs cradle system right here on hand and he wanted me to not only assemble the uniform but fully completed with the model's machine gun. He sent me the cradle to work on however it turns out that he did not have the M1919 itself and with the armor packs mount you kind of have to use his M1919 because the system is geared around his own ecosystem. We tried to see if it would fit on either the Dragon and Dreams M1919 or the Dragon M1919, and both of those are very close to the overall spec and size to the armor pack set, but would require some modifications in order to get to fit onto the mount, while again, the armor pack system just drops directly in place. So he went ahead and decided to acquire the armor packs gun, to which then I ordered it from armor packs, and it finally came in the mail. Now with the components on hand, I could go ahead and fully assemble both of the units and get them fully painted. In this video, we're going to go ahead and describe the assembly of both of these units, as well as I'm also going to do something that I don't frequently show in these videos, and that is me painting and weathering the components, showcasing some of the painting techniques that I do utilize on a multitude of my builds. Well, with that long-winded intro out of the way, let's go ahead and start on the build itself. For the set, I'm actually going to first start with assembling the M1919, and then I could go ahead and assemble the cradle around it. The sets that we have here are all comprised 100% out of cast white metal alloy. Now, this is basically the majority of Armor Pax's catalog and aftermarket range. However, he does offer a range of resin components as well. However, for the parts that we have here, that's not the case and they are all made out of his white metal alloy. Now, some people out there might have some difficulties with working with this material because just like with several other mediums like cast resin, for instance, you need to have a special skill set when working with this type of material. And if you do not have the skill set or the experience or even the tools required, it's going to lead to some problems with your overall assembly. All right, so dumping the parts out on the table, let's see what the kit consists of. Well, first we have an instruction sheet, which is nice and handy. And then I could just dump out the components here on the table and hopefully the table is level enough so they, they don't roll off. And then I have to go ahead and play recovery. And that does not seem to be the case, so that's good. Okay, so here we have the here we have the receiver section. Note that the flip-up sight is in the extended position. It does have some interior detailing. Note the cam track found on the bolt carrier. The remainder of the 1919's details are adequate again for the material. It's missing the back plate, which is a separate part. Of course, on the bottom portion of the gun here, we have the ejection port. All Browning machine guns are bottom eject. And the ejection port is just this unceremonious cavern that we have here on the inside. And really, the only thing preventing you from seeing all the way through would be the bolt and the bolt carrier in its closed position. From the receiver 
takes us to the barrel, or I should say the barrel shroud, which is a very iconic bit of detailing found on the air cooled 1919. The holes are present, they are the correct size, and hopefully I can get into focus. It's, the camera's having trouble with this material in the white here, but the holes again are the right scale and the no, the correct numbers are found on this section. We have two options of boosters where we have this unit here as well as the turn down unit. Now if my 1919 parlance is correct, I believe this one here is actually the post-war 762 NATO version which was used by the Israelis. They had a slightly different contour to it compared to the original USGI 30-06 caliber 1919s that we have here. So that's nice that Armor Packs does give you the option for those. Which, by the way, I want to thank Ian from Forgotten Weapons for discussing that in one of his videos. Quick little shout out. The remainder of the details, here we have the back plate complete with the pistol grip as well as the trigger assembly. As well as the little takedown screw which is found in here but again the camera is just not having it with this one so let's move on but the piece does have that nice little notch found on the bottom of the pistol grip and here we have the feed tray cover with this extended portion here which I believe if I'm not mistaken might be an Israeli modification for 762 a little hazy on that got to brush up on that video again and here we have the camming mechanism for the the belt feed as well as the feed paw mechanism found here on the top. The little spring mechanism is integrally molded into the top cover and it's a nice bit of detailing. Of course here we have our charging handle. It is hollow just like on the real unit. This here is the rear side assembly and it bolts to the side of the receiver. And the remainder of the parts are for the ammo can. Now what's neat about the armor pack set is that he supplies you with the early pattern wood ammunition box which was used at, by the US military during the early portion of World War II. These of course would eventually be phased out with the stamped steel ammo cans that we're really used to and accustomed to but the armor pack set does give you the wooden ammo can which is nicely rendered in its own right. The next bit of detail is this little component that we have here which is the hinge work. Of course the hinge is not for the 1919 but is for the ammo can. The hinge itself is nicely rendered with its appropriate geometry as well as the little details that are molded into the surface. Now the hinge itself is designed to be a static display component and is not one that's intended to be functional. And that now takes to the ammo belt. You see the can can be rendered in two different configurations. You can have it fully buttoned up or you can have it in the open configuration showing the ammunition held inside. The ammunition is just a dummy and it, obviously it's molded in one solid piece of white metal. The detailing on the ammo belt section is pretty good. You can clearly make out the the projectiles, the brass casings, and also the belt. Now it appears that for this one here he rendered it with a disintegrating link belt. Of course on the M1919 the belt would have been in two configurations. You would have had the disintegrating link belt like this one or it would have been a canvas belt that is a reloadable non disintegrating type design. Of course the unit is not designed to have a little section that goes into the machine guns receiver. It's just meant to have the unit displayed in the open position. So with all this out of the way let's go ahead and start the actual construction of this unit. Now in order to assemble the set here, some of the basic tools that you are going to need is a bottle of CA, an X-Acto of some flavor or another, a set of needle files is very handy, and also a little bit of sandpaper. Now if anyone's a fan of my other 1-6 scale content, you'll note that on many occasions I incorporate armor packs components on those builds and when I do on many occasions I go ahead and utilize a soldering iron to assemble some of the parts or some of their sub-assemblies. That may be the case for this one here or it may not. You see this is literally my first go ahead at these two sets here so I'm going to discover if I need to use this system or not on these components. And of course, if I do, I'm going to mention it and bring you guys all along with me. Okay, with all that out of the way, it's now time to actually dig into this build. And it's best not to put the cart before the horse, so I'm going to start with the 1919 itself. So let me get the can out of the way, the hinge, and just focus on the meat and potatoes of it. 
Now, the sets themselves, like I stated before, are nicely done out of the box, but just like with all plastic model kits or just model kits in general, there is going to be a little bit of prep work required by the builder in order to help the parts fit on better and also to clean up some of the casting seams and edges. So, and, that, and the armor packs pieces are no different. The receiver has a little bit of flash on it in some locations. Again, nothing that's a deal breaker or anything that's bad. Again, it's basically customary on all these type of sets. Same can also be said here for the the shroud. There's a small seam line on these two sections. And this is something that's easily going to be polished away with some sandpaper. For the receiver over here, this is where I'm going to use the needle file to just polish away these small little sections that are remaining. And it's not just flash, but it looks like a little bit of sprue. Again, nothing that a needle file can take care of with some quick work. Now that the body sections have had their seams polished away, the next step is to fit the feet tray cover. Here's the feet tray cover. Polishing wise, there's not really a whole lot to do here, but the one thing that is gonna have to be done is with the way it mates to the front trunnion area of the receiver. You see, with the way the armor packs kit is designed, the with, because of the way it's molded, the hinge section here is plugged up with a little bit of metal. So this metal is going to have to be removed in order to get the feed tray cover to properly drop in place. You can see the indentation where it needs to go. And as for the how much needs to be removed with the thickness, it's not really a whole lot. It's probably about, eh, about a little over 16 of an inch or maybe about two millimeters or so for my metric audience. In order to do this, I'm going to utilize the Dremel and the tool of choice is going to be a router bit. The router bit I'm using here is a 2.40 millimeter router bit or a 0 0.0945 inch pattern router bit. These router bits here I purchased from my vendor who the, <laughs> the name eludes me at the moment. However, you'll see right here with the magic of editing a URL for this vendor of choice and he this is the guy I get all of my micro bits from. So it's a good guy and uh, give him some business. Now in order to remove the material, the Dremel needs to be going at a really slow speed. The material itself is basically like, well, casting in solder. And if the material heats up, it can melt and cause some issues on you. And if you're going slow, this will alleviate a lot of those problems. So with that, let's go ahead and start digging away.
Well, you can see that after a little bit of work with the Dremel, I was able to remove the material that was necessary, but it's not there yet. The Dremel removes the majority of the material, but the edges you'll notice are rounded because again of the shape of the cutting tool. In order to square this off, I'm going to use a needle file in order to go in there and just to square off the two edges. The depth of the cutout, however, seems to be good to go, so I'm not going to adjust that portion of it. And after a little bit of work with the square needle file, as well as a little bit of help from the Exacto, I was able to square off the edges here on the front trunnion. Here's the top cover, and I'll just drop directly into place like this. Now with the way the kit is designed, the piece is intended to be static display, so the top V cover is not functional. However, obviously it's your choice if you could render the unit either with the V cover in the open position like I have here, or in the closed position like I just showed. Alright, so now that the bulk of the receiver is all done, set that aside and now I'm going to start refining the top cover. Like I said, it's not really too much work that needs to be done. If you look on the sides here, there's a small seam line from where the halves of the molds were interacting. So I'm just going to go ahead and just polish down with a little bit of sandpaper. And again, that's really all this component needs in order to refine it further. Moving along to the rear plate, pistol grip, and trigger assembly, the unit has a lot of nice little details molded in, and when you're polishing away some of the small seam work, you want to be careful not to accidentally remove some details that are integrally molded in. What am I talking about? Well, quite simply put, the little takedown spring lock mechanism that's found right here, right on top of the tube. If you'll notice, it's a small little nub that's molded in. It can easily be mistaken for just a bit of spludge, so don't amputate that. On the rear portion here of the tube, there's a large slot screw found in this section, so again, be careful when you're polishing that. And also on the top portion here, you'll see this little reinforcement rib that's integrally molded in. This is not any extra flash or anything. This is found on the real cast units. Here I'm just polishing a little bit of that little seam line on the inside portion here of the pistol grip. It's not really a whole lot there, just a few passes all that are required, but you have to be careful of course not to bump into the little trigger detailing. There we have it. So from here, it then will just plug directly in the rear portion here of the receiver. The hole is integrally molded in, but it's molded shallow, so with a drill bit I'm going to go ahead and bore this out just so the m enough material is removed in order for the pistol grip rear plate just to drop directly in place. But that will be done after the polishing, so this now brings us to the barrel shroud. Again, just a simple seam found on these two sections. I'm just going to polish that away with some sandpaper. With all of the sanding now out of the way, the next thing to do is to prep the receiver and the barrel shroud for final assembly. Like I stated before, there are mounting holes found on the rear portion here for the back plate, as well as the front portion here for the barrel shroud. But they, well specifically for the one in the rear, it's molded really shallow, so you're going to need to drill this pilot hole out in order to get the piece to properly fit in. The tool of choice I'm going to use is a drill press, but of course you can easily use a pin vise or a Dremel in order to do the same procedure. I'm just using the drill press because really I have it on hand, so really why not? In order to drill this out, I'm going to be utilizing a 764th of an inch drill bit. These drill bits are a common size and can be found just about anywhere. I'm just going to mount the unit here right into the chuck.
Now I am going to take a needle file and polish down this small little area over here because there's a slight bit of material that came up from the drilling process. This is unavoidable, but again, it's just easily removed with a few more swipes with the needle file. And that takes care of the rear portion. Now the front portion, I'm also going to need to drill a small little hole in. You see on the front barrel section, the way it's the kit's designed, you just glue the barrel shroud to the receiver. But one thing that I noticed that can be improved upon is with the strength of the piece. Because these pieces are metal and this is a long object that's even going to have another heavy object hanging on the end, this can cause some strain to the glues and adhesives that are used. So in order to prevent the piece from getting loose or even drooping on me, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drill a hole into this portion here of the barrel shroud and this portion here of the receiver and install a metal pin. The metal pin will give more rigidity to this section here, thus making it a much stronger assembly compared to just gluing it on standard. Now on the barrel shroud here, this is pretty easy to do. You just go in here with a drill bit, bore it out, and then you have your center hole. On the receiver, it's going to require a little bit of an extra step because hopefully this gets into focus, but on the inside here, you can see the small little pin that's integrally molded in. This pin is going to be in the way and needs to be amputated first in order for me to drill the hole out. Luckily, after the pin gets removed, this area here becomes an indentation which will help align the drill bit in order to go in to make the hole. For the pin, I'm going to be utilizing a 16 of an inch metal rod, which will be more than enough to give you the strength required in order to keep these pieces at bay. But in order to do that, I need to change my drill bit out and make some more chips. Now because of the thinner bit and as well as with the longer depth I'm going to be drilling, for this one I am going to be using a squirt of WD-40 just to keep the bit and the piece nice and cool. So with a little squirt right here, I'm ready to go. The depth is about three quarters of an inch, so it's a good amount of material in here to support the weight of the rod. And technically, I could have also done the same technique on the lathe, which would have done a more truer hole in this section over here. But for the purposes of this build, it's really fine with this method as well. Once the barrel's all drilled out, it's now time to remove that peg that's found here on the inside. And as you can see, I'm going to be utilizing the router bit for this. Now for this one here, I'm going to go with a little bit of a faster speed with this small little surface area here. It should just pop right off. And that's it. With the little peg now gone, I'm going to put a squirt of WD-40 here and drill it out on the drill press. Well, just like with the barrel section on the receiver here, I went a good a minimum of three quarters of an inch, which again gives a lot of surface area in order to grab onto. Also, one thing I want to point out that makes this modification a good one is because with the way the kit is designed, this portion here from the trunnion all the way back to the end is one solid block of metal. So you have plenty of material around in order to drill this thing out without it protruding or chewing away any of these detail sections that we have here on the top or possibly poking out on the bottom. Back on the barrel shroud, on the front portion here, I'm going to be drilling out this area in order for the booster tip to fit in. Just like with the pistol grip assembly, there is an integrally molded in nub found on the rear portion that will lock directly in place. There is a small little indentation found molded into this section here, but it's really just there to be a pilot hole for you to use a drill bit in order to remove some material. Just like before, I'm going to add a little drop of WD and bore it out. The drill bit is the same 764 drill bit that I utilized before. For the front section, you don't have to go nearly as deep as the other section because the booster tip is only about a 16 of an inch in depth, if that. So that's really all you need. 
Well, once the last of the holes are drilled, the unit is now ready for assembly, and all the components you see here are to assemble the 1919. The only thing I want to mention was because I used some WD-40 before as a lubricant for the drilling process, I went ahead and quickly soaked and washed and rinsed out the receiver and the barrel section in order to just remove any residual WD-40, which can cause problems with the glue setting, as well as also the final paint and finish application that's going to be done later. Well. Now it's time for the assembly process, so. Once that you confirm that the barrel assembly wasn't done by Sentry Arms, it's now time to progress further. Now there is no orientation for the slot that we have here. On the real one, you would simply just use this slot for a bar to get a little leverage in order to screw this unit in place. And once the threads bottom out, the unit is installed. With the gun out of the way, let's now focus our attention on the ammo can. Ammo can seems like the only hand fittings it requires to remove these two little nubs that are molded into the little feedway track over here, which will inhibit the side plate from getting glued on this box. So for this, I'm just gonna either use a Dremel or maybe an X-Acto or possibly a needle file. Can I just polish that down? Yeah, I don't even need the Dremel. The needle file should do just fine. Note the orientation, the part with the inset here goes on the bottom. And it should just slide directly into place. Like so. I am going to take some more glue just to run it along the edges here. So it fills in that little gap and gives some added strength. I'm also going to do the same thing for the inside. Now that we have the box, I'm going to go ahead and install the hinge. Now the way the hinge is, with that little tab that I showcased before, that is the clearance for the little strap that we have here on the front. So the piece will go on in this manner. Now at the moment I am not going to glue the lid onto the box because I am going to go ahead and paint the ammunition that we have here and drop it in and it'll be the customer's decision whether or whether or not to have the box displayed in the open or closed state. So now the ammo box and the 1919 are all set. It's now time to work on the cradle. The reason why I needed to have the gun assembled first was because with the way the cradle is shaped here. I need to see if it, the unit's just going to drop directly in place or if I'm going to have to do some sort of modifications to the width. 
but as you can see, the unit is literally made for each other, so none of those mods are going to be necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and set these guys aside and work now on the cradle mount. Now that I know that the cradle fits onto the receiver of the 1919 absolutely perfectly, I can now shift my attention to the remainder of the cradle. Here I have the instruction sheet for the cradle, and as you can see, it gives you a pretty good idea on exactly where the pieces go and how they affix. Now, like I said before, I wasn't sure if I was going to need solder in order to complete the assembly of these parts, but after reviewing the instructions further and seeing the parts in person, I could definitely say that that is going to be something I'm going to have to do. It even basically recommends it right here in the instructions that you can see clear as day in many of the locations and where they go. So... In addition to the solder, I'm also going to make another slight modification with the way the yoke mounts onto the pinnel mount. The assembly of these two pieces here are very similar to what was seen earlier on the barrel shroud and receiver of the 1919. The unit will simply just plug into this section over here and is intended to be held in place with adhesives. Well, with the extra added weight of the 1919 and that big heavy metal faux wooden box that it has, I don't think that that's going to really hold up and might put a lot of stress on these locations over here. So I am going to do the same modification that I made earlier where I drill these sections out and in, use a metal wire to hold them in place which will give them more rigidity and more strength. the holes drilled out, it's now time to commence the remainder of the assembly, and that's going to start with this component that we have here. With the way the kit is designed, it's nicely done because we have these two pieces, these rails that are integrally molded into the panel, and this aligns perfectly the component that needs to just slide into the section that we have here. Now, the piece is being held in the vise, but it's not being held in a really strong way. It's just the jaws are have just enough pressure to keep it in place but you don't want to over tighten it because obviously this soft metal here will just get deformed and get destroyed if you apply some good pressure to it. Now the assembly of this is going to be one that orientation is going to be absolutely crucial. You don't want to install it upside down and the instructions do have the proper orientation well illustrated so you want to pay attention to that. The piece, like I stated, goes in this location right here, and you want to make sure it's in a nice square manner. And again, with the way the armor packs kit is designed, it locks it into place absolutely perfectly. Now, to secure this component to the piece here, I'm going to utilize solder. You can theoretically use super glues for this, but I feel that the super glues, in combination with all the weight that's going to be exerted on this piece here, might be less than ideal for the situation at hand. It should be able to work, but for this one here, probably the best route will be using solder. Having said that, using solder on one of these sets here is a very risky procedure and should only be done if the individual has a lot of experience with working with fine metalworking and soldering. If you're not comfortable with that type of procedure, you want to avoid using the steps I'm going to take because you can easily screw this piece up beyond compare and you're going to be left, you know, basically pounding sand. Now in order to solder it together, I'm going to be utilizing my soldering iron that we have here. This unit I purchased off of Amazon and has been seen on a few of my other videos. I'm still going to be using the same tub of Disgusting Flux that we have here. And for the solder, you guess it's the same one that I typically use, which is the 6040 grade lead solder. This is electrical solder, and it, I always use it on pretty much just about everything. Specifically fine detail work like this. Now, in order to solder it in place, I'm going to add a bit of flux to this section here as well as on the two ends, which is where I'm going to be spending the majority of the time with the soldering. Now, with the material that Armor Packs uses, he basically casts this in a material which is very similar to solder. So, 
the solder on the positive side melts and adheres perfectly to these components. On the other end, once the part starts getting hot, the piece, the heat's just going to radiate. And when it does, the whole piece will just has the potential of melting in on itself. So, like I stated before, it's one of those things you have to be really, really careful for, and you have to have a lot of experience with. If you don't have this experience here, I recommend just going to the super glue route. And in order to secure this, you could possibly drill a hole in the center here and in the center here and just secure it in place with a metal wire. So there goes your life raft in case the soldering is not something that you want any part of. Hopefully with the camera readjusted, it gives me enough elbow room to work around this area here without causing too much interruptions with me bumping into the camera, which makes some really bad noises. And yet again, you can still see what the hell I'm actually doing. So the iron is nice and hot. And let's go ahead and do this. If you notice, I actually moved the unit up because the vise was acting as a heat sink, drawing heat away from the iron and the metal, giving it a weaker bond with the actual weld. So Now I'm going to do it on the opposite side, which you're probably not going to be able to see. And the unit is now in place. I am going to refine the welds a little bit, cleaning them up, making them look a little bit more presentable. but. Other than that, we're pretty much good to go. And here's the piece now with the soldering concluded. You can see that there's no wiggle, it's a nice strong bond, and it should be more than suffice at keeping this thing held up without the weight causing any problems with collapsing. Once the piece is soldered on, the next assembly is going to be the yolk. Here I have the yolk now fitted with its metal rod, which I'm now going to cut and then drop it directly into place. I'm going to dry fit it first just to see if I need to shorten the rod or if it's good with the length that you see it here. Now in case anyone's wondering, John, can you make this piece function where it can pivot? The answer is actually yes. It's not too hard to do, you just, instead of using this rod here, you use a, um, a bolt, like a M3 by 20 millimeter fastener of one flavor or another. You then drill and tap this out on the inside, so when you secure the bolt, you can then have the piece lock in place and the yoke can freely rotate. However, because of the travel lock system that this thing has, you can't really do that with the unit built out of the box, and would require a little bit more modifications than, and that's really out of the scope of this video. So, once the unit is fitted, just line it up, and the yolk is now permanently attached to the panel. It's also nice and sturdy. As you can see, you don't have any wobble, which again is more than suffice for holding up the weight of that gun. The next step is going to be fitting on the cradle, which is going to fit onto this unit here. Now you have to be very careful because you need to slightly pry open the yolk in order for the cradle to drop in place because there are rotating knobs found on molded on the inside of these portions here. So you have to be very careful because you can easily overbend and snap this material. If that happens, uh, your options start dropping very quickly on solutions for that. So be careful. Once they are in place though, you're all set. Once the unit lines up, you just basically squeeze the yolk sections back where they need to be. You could use plier but I was able to do it just by hand and now the piece is permanently affixed. The next bit of equipment is going to be the elevation lock which secures to the back here. On the real unit this is actually a spring retained piece and can pivot out of the way if you want to just freely rotate the gun. But on the model here the detailing is integrally molded. However, before you can secure this in place, a small hole needs to be drilled in this round section here, and this was done with a 16 of an inch drill bit on the drill press. The piece does have a small little dimple found in, so aligning the hole is not very difficult. Now when the piece is received, it's in this flat manner that we have here, and you have to pry it open in order to get it to fit into those two recesses. This is easy to do, and the best way I found is with a screwdriver. Just simply take your flathead screwdriver, 
line it up and just run it along the channel there and the piece will just naturally pry open. Once it gets open to a certain point you can easily adjust or I should say make fine adjustments with your finger. Piece just lines up like the way you see it here. Now if you notice I went ahead and rotated this out of the way just so it gives me better access to work in this location over here. Once the unit here is pried to the appropriate shape it's now time to secure on this little loose fitting that we have here. This is the unit that will bridge this part to the cradle and sandwich the machine gun in its place. Now this piece here was partially drilled out where the two front holes were integrally molded hollow but the back portion here needs to be drilled out. This was done very very carefully because again you can easily screw this up. I used a pin vise with that same one 0.15 millimeter bit that I mentioned before in order to drill out the pilot hole. Once that hole was drilled out it was still too small in order to fit the kit supply pin. So on the drill press with a 1 8 of an inch drill bit I was able to carefully hog out the remainder of the material. Once it was done it leaves for a nice perfect machining piece that, or machine piece that you see here. Now that the unit is drilled out it's now time for installation. Note the again the orientation. We have these two little nubs that are found on this portion over here and these get pointed in the up direction. The unit will mount on in this type of format. Sorry, a little difficult to get all on camera with only two hands but basically you want to have these two little nubs pointing in the upper direction towards the bottom of the machine gun. The pin is on the longer end which is great because then I can actually just solder everything in place so just with a little bit of flux over here just crank up the heat here on the iron a little solder on it just for good measure and I'm just going to solder this thing to a mushroom shape and there we have it piece is retained it's not going anywhere and it's fully flexible where I can have this adjustability which is going to come in place once it, the machine gun needs to be fitted in the yolk. This is one of the most crucial aspects of lining the piece up because if the piece is not properly set you're going to be in trouble because you're not going to be able to readjust it once everything is glued or soldered in place. More so with glue because you just pop it but solder not so much. Once this is done it's now time to pin everything in place which should align it and allow me to solder it this unit in permanently. The idea of pinning everything together is that this is going to act as an alignment jig and prevent, hopefully knock on wood, any sort of unwanted surprises once the gun gets fitted. So in order to do that I'm going to take this kit supply pin, put it through these holes which will sandwich this elevation unit in place. I went ahead and added the flux to the piece here and I also swapped out the kit supply pin with a wire brad. The wire brad is stronger and it's also longer than the kit supply one which gives me more fiddle room to mess around with. So, Okay so that is now in place. Everything looks good. And at this point here I'm ready to add the last two solder seams. And that's it. We're now all set with the elevation mount. The last thing to install, besides the gun that is, is going to be the ammo box tray holder, which goes on the opposite side of the gun. That's what we have these two holes here for, and the unit should just drop directly into place without too much coercion. Once fitted, this is also going to be soldered in place. So, add some flux. That's a little too much flux, but. Okay. 
just line up the holes and progress or proceed with the soldering. Okay, so you can see that the piece is now permanently attached. The solder beads themselves are nice and clean, which is a huge plus. And, well, that's pretty much it. This unit now, as well as the 1919 and the ammo can, can go directly into paint. But before I do, I am going to give this thing a little bit of a paint thinner wash just to get any of this flux removed.